Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm, I'm Thomas Small. I was your mayor up until three days ago. So you can see my step is much lighter now. <laughs> but I, it, is, it is a tremendous, I'm so happy to see all of you here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. This is really uh, the Culver City Speaker Series that really began as the prelude series to our general plan is a hugely important part of our general plan and of, of uh, participating and, and having a hand in, in our city, how our city runs, the design of our city, and the future of our city. So it's, it's really important for you all to be here uh, and, and to take part in this. And it's, it's uh, you know, so much, we talk so much in, in, uh, in city politics and at conferences about, uh, you know, how, how the city is the level at which things really happen, at which, at which uh, you know, we can, government can really affect the quality of our, our lives. But creating that government, running that government, participating in governing ourselves, it's really participating in events like this and, and participating in the local government make, that makes the hugest difference. So thank you all so much for being here. I know we're going to have more events like this, um, but few with, with someone as admired and renowned as Dr. Donald Shoup. Now, I, I uh, was telling him earlier tonight, he doesn't, he of course could not possibly remember, but I first met him and heard him speak more than 20 years ago at the urban planning seminar at, U, at USC, um, and I have remembered it to this day. There are, you know, every once in a while it seems that there's someone that comes along with a point of view, with a theory, with a different way of looking at a problem that is, that is instrumental and that changes the direction of, of how uh, an industry or how a, a, a you know, some, some sort of activity in human endeavors works and who changes the direction of it. And I think Dr. Shoup is, is, is in that club. The, you know, 20 some years ago, um, I, th I think that his ideas seemed more radical uh, than they do now. now. Now, as you'll see, I'm sure during his talk, now, now it's really come to a point where we can all see the importance of what he's talking about. But he was he was prescient in that sense, um, and and but now is now is the time that we can actually that we have a and that we have a better opportunity to really implement the things he's talking about. But uh, in in terms of, of parking and urban planning, we are so fortunate to live in Los Angeles and to live near UCLA to have uh, access to to someone like Dr. Shoup. But the the Wall Street Journal. Re referred to him as a rock star of parking and, and as the Yoda of urban planning. So I, I, I think that's, 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 uh, that describes him about as well as, well as can be done. Um, and and uh, thank you so much for coming to see us, Dr. Shoup. Sure, my mic is on. Well, thank you, Mary, Mary Small. I can't possibly live up to that introduction, so I want to warn you uh, right away. Um, I was uh, pleased to learn that I had been called a parking rock star, but I know that's not the same thing as a real rock star. Uh, nevertheless, I'm thinking of changing my name to Shoot Dog. <laughs> um, and uh, can we turn on the PowerPoint? Um, <laughs> You can't, you, can't, you can't do anything without, without having the PowerPoint ready, is it? Well, that looks right. Um, yes, and, and I was pleased to, to be called the Yoda of urban, urban planning until I remembered from Star Wars that Yoda was 800 years old. Um, um, and, and everything he said seemed like cryptic nonsense to me. Um, well, you're, you're thinking of changing your zoning code, and I'd like to, to mention that uh, there, there are three basic elements of a zoning code um, that the uh, permitted uses it tells developers and property owners uh, what they can and cannot do on a specific site. You could build a single family home, um, but not an apartment building. And that was well established in the 1920s. Uh, and there's also what's called the bulk regulations, how much you can build on the site. Was the height limit and the 
side setbacks and the floor area ratio. So they, again, they tell you what you can and you cannot do. Um, uh, but the third element is off-street parking requirements. Uh, and they are, they are different because they tell, for, tell developers what they must do. They must provide four spaces per thousand square feet uh, without any attention to the cost of this. Um, so they impose costs on housing and commerce and, and everything else uh, to provide parking for cars. Um, but planners don't estimate the subsidies implicit in either these, of these parking requirements. Um, uh, so all three of these, of these examples I, I think are to some extent unfortunate choices in life that uh, we later categorize as like it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, and with parking requirements, we now know what the uh, uh, outcome is. Uh, I think too much of suburban America, uh, unfortunately not too much of, of Culver City, looks like this view of Silicon Valley. And we tend to ignore this asphalt blight in our daily, uh, daily life, especially when we're parked free of it, as all of these cars are here. And as all of you who drove tonight uh, will park, park free. Um, but just because the driver doesn't pay for parking doesn't mean the cost goes away. The cost is still there, and somebody has to pay for it, including people who are too poor to own a car. It gets, the cost gets shifted for, at a grocery store. Um, who pays for the free parking at a grocery store? A co-opportunity, for example, where I just went to. Well, the drivers don't pay for it. Well, maybe it's the, all the customers at Cooperative, uh, even those who don't own a car. So all the required parking spaces drive wedges, uh, asphalt wedges between buildings, making it more difficult and less pleasant to walk anywhere. That's just one building. This is the, the whole campus, they call it, of Cisco Systems. And I, I imagine the, that they were responsible for some of the technology we're using tonight. But, but it, it creates developments that are eminently drivable, uh, but scarcely walkable. Um, uh, uh, the development looks like this because San Jose's parking requirements require it. Um, segregating land uses, limiting density, and requiring off-street parking produce the kind of land use that we see today. Here is the, whenever I go to a city, I say, well, here's San Jose's minimum parking requirements. This is why San Jose looks the way it does. The green bar represents a 1,000 square feet of building area, and the red bar represents the size of the required parking lot spaces, either in a surface lot or in a structure. So I guess dancing and skating are similar, so maybe they would have similar parking requirements. And, uh, but I don't know why a skating rink in an auction house needs the same amount of parking. Is that, did any planner really do a study showing that? And do an planners think that most animals don't drive to get their to get grooming? That, um, I think when you talk to planners, they'll usually be quite honest and say, I don't know how these parking requirements came about, but I know that I have to enforce them because they're in the city code. We hear of Culver City's parking requirements. It has some high ones. Uh, the required parking lots are bigger than the buildings for all of these land uses. The, the parking lot for a church is 11 times the, uh, the area of the assembly area in the church. Uh, and Culver City seems to expect everyone will drive to bars and nightclubs. We certainly have to have a lot of parking if you're going to have, uh, sell alcohol. And, and why does a skating rink need twice as many parking spaces as a fitness facility? And does Culver City even have a, a skating ring? Well, uh, uh, maybe it does. Well, there are some areas of Culver City that have a lot of parking. You can't always see it from the air, like because we're, you're parked at this school tonight. It looks like it's inside of a building. But there's a lot of parking in Culver City. But where do the Culver City planners learn how to uh, uh, set these parking requirements? Because there are hundreds of land uses. Um, uh, the planners are asked in a difficult position when they're asked to set the parking requirements because they don't know the demand for parking in every art gallery or bowling alley or dance hall or fitness club or hardware store or movie theater or uh, 
pet store or nail salon or hundreds of other land uses. They never learned about it in, 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 pl in planning school because the planner professors had nothing to teach them. So what is the book on parking standards about? Um, that we have to set the parking requirements. Say if the, if the city planning commission asked the uh, practicing planner to set the parking requirements for a nail salon, the, the, the intern or the planner couldn't say, I don't know, or I don't think we should have parking requirements, you'd be fired. You wouldn't be useful. Um, so planners sort of have a mumbo jumbo of, of, of rational planning to uh, provide a veneer of professional language. Um, uh, it's an ad hoc talent learned on the job. Uh, it's more of a political activity uh, than a professional skill. Uh, so despite having lacking almost any data or theory, uh, planners have managed to set parking requirements for hundreds of land uses in thousands of cities. The 10,000 commandments for off-street parking. And this is the cover of the publication from the American Planning Association reporting on parking standards. Well, that sounds like a good thing. High standards, we all want that for everything. Uh, but the report says nothing about standards. It doesn't say what parking requirements should be. It only reports the parking requirements from a small selection of cities. And here's just a list of one page of land uses. There are eight pages like this. Of all, this is starting with, from abattoir, uh, I forget what the, the Z one was, but it, it, there are 11 different adult land uses that they, there are parking requirements for. They have separate parking requirements for an adult arcade, adult cabaret, adult theater, adult bookstore, adult massage parlor, and a sex novelty shop. Well, how are the planners supposed to know the difference in how much the parking demand of that? Have they, have, they, have, they, have they been to a lot of these things? And we're in bad shape if this is what the American Planning Association's images is of the United States. So this is, there are just hundreds of pages like this of, of you know, park, the parking requirements for adult cabarets in five or six cities. And each one of these parking requirements, like the ones in Culver City, taken alone, seems to make sense. Uh, they look simple when their planners can par link parking to people, like one space per tennis player or two spaces per barber, um, uh, or three spaces per beautician. Um, uh, there's, a, there's often a gender difference that's hard to explain. Uh, but the, uh, the, they all seem to require at least one space for every person, except for religious land uses, and even then there's gender discrimination. Uh, but once you get away from requiring parking per person, uh, then the requirements get dazzling in their, in their in combination of precision and um, inventiveness. Uh, like, um, uh, well, for a sex novelty shop, it's very easy to say how many parking spaces per thousand square feet. That's what a lot of things are. But when you get beyond people and square feet, uh, then it has to be always per something. How many parking spaces per something for a gas station or for a swimming pool? I mean, how could you have a public swimming pool without knowing how many parking spaces are going to be there? We can't allow a swimming pool without a lot of parking spaces. Um, and even for the afterlife. Um, uh, so I think that the general public thinks that parking requirements are sort of scientific, like, like the, 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 the periodic table of the elements. Every land use has a parking requirement. There are related land uses that have similar parking requirements. But it's not like the periodic table of the elements. It's more like the 19th century science of phrenology, uh, which was the leading theory of how the brain worked. As you can feel the outside of somebody's skull and say, oh, that person is very selfish or generous or uh, depraved, uh, but thinking that you can just touch a skull and say, well, this tells you something about the, the person, that's rather like uh, the notion that without knowing anything about the cost of parking spaces or the price charged for using them, planners know how many parking spaces there are for every land use. Uh, they, just, they just have needs, um, like related to the number of fuel nozzles at a gas station or nuns in the convent or reposing rooms in a funeral parlor. I think we will look back and think these parking requirements are just as ridiculous as phrenology is to us. 
The difference between parking requirements and phrenology is that phrenology didn't do any harm. And I think the parking requirements are doing immense amount of harm. But, you know, I, I realize I'm coming into a, a new city and not everybody agrees with me that many people believe in minimum parking requirements. They, they do believe we need them. Uh, that uh, that uh, I adapted this song from Monty Python to suggest that all street parking requirements are almost like an established religion in city planning, no matter how much damage they do. One should not ever criticize anyone else's religion, of course, but when it comes to parking requirements, I'm a Protestant, and I believe the city needs a reformation uh, for several reasons, um, because partly because the, the way that planners um, they're, they're, we are complicit in these parking requirements. Uh, that, that we don't really make it obvious that we don't uh, know how much the parking spaces cost. Say, do you have any idea how much the parking spaces in this building cost, or the parking three levels of underground parking in one of any of the new buildings in this in this neighborhood, or under co-opportunity? You don't know how much they cost. The most recent uh, parking structure built at UCLA cost eighty-four thousand dollars a space. And you compare that to the median net worth of, of households of the United States, it dwarfs many people's uh, uh, net worth. The, the median net worth for black households in the United States is about $9,000 a year. Half of the people have less than $9,000 in net worth. And yet we're saying, well, for the grocery store that you're going to, you need at least five parking spaces per thousand square feet without any notion that these people cannot afford to pay for it. Um, and we don't know how much it increases the cost of, of housing or of tuition at this school, um, uh, or how it affects uh, urban design. I think that uh, uh, Culver City has very good urban design in many things, but uh, parking requirements can do a lot of harm. Uh, especially, especially the expensive stuff underground is the best kind, but that's wildly expensive. Or how do all these parking spaces affect congestion or the demand for the uh, expo line? If you can park free um, wherever you're going, <laughs> why get on a, on a rail line? Or how it affect uh, fuel consumption and CO2 emissions? Even building a parking structure creates a lot of emissions, but then using it creates a lot of emissions. And the planners have no training in how to set a parking requirement. Um, so I think that the problem is that, uh, that we are politicizing what should be a business decision, uh, and we are governmentalizing what should be a market choice. Uh, uh, Off-street parking will re represent the triumph of qual quantity over quality in urban planning. The planners should stop spending so much time worrying about the, the uh, number of parking spaces and worry more about the design. Uh, two days ago, uh, maybe some of you uh, went to this uh, uh, meeting on the, the past, present, and future of housing in Culver City. I suppose that upper image is of the past, but it's also pretty close to the present as well. Uh, but uh, Culver City's parking requirements seem inconsistent. It, they seem consistent only with the past and not with the future uh, goals of the city. Uh, Off-street parking requirements are not the right path to a sustainable and prosperous future. If, if Culver City has such a great appetite for so many meetings on, on housing and parking, I hope the city is ready to make reforms. Um, well, I think that one of the, the problems is that there's so much more parking per car than there is um, uh, 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 housing for people. That each car has about, what, about uh, 1,300 square feet of parking available to it. And we have about 720 square feet of housing per person in the United States. Uh, so. Uh, most most parking of this parking is free. Ninety nine percent of most auto of automobile trips end up in a free parking space, free to the driver, but not free to society. So it could encourage us to buy cars and um, uh, um, and congest traffic and pollute the air. Uh, I don't see how anybody could deny that a lot of parking has these bad bad effects, um, and it burdens everyone, um, including people who are. Um, uh, uh, homeless. 
everything they buy has to somehow pay for parking. Um, so I think we've got our priorities exactly the wrong way around. And I think that if you want more housing and less traffic, you should stop requiring plenty of parking for all housing. It just doesn't make sense, I think. But let's, let's look at some of the things we have been doing, right? I think that, um, that one of the things that can be done now, I think, I think we're in a position to make huge uh, strides forward, uh, that converting housing into apartments, uh, garages, I'm sorry, converting garages into apartments, up until recently has been illegal. There are plenty of it, but it's all illegal. So now the state has forced cities to say you have to allow conversion of garages into apartments. And I think that these, um, these granny flats are a terrific way to increase the, the housing supply, especially the ones that face the street. They're not in the backyard, they're facing the street. That, uh, that uh, uh, here's one, the last one was right across from, from, from where my wife and I live. This was right next to UCLA. I think I was told by an architect that the presence of, of the snout houses or these garage doors that sort of dominate the front of houses is the biggest change in domestic architecture in the past 500 years. Is that we're just so used to the idea that the front of a, of a building should have a two-car garage attached. So I think if we allow uh, people to um, um, convert their garages uh, into apartments and park in the driveway, uh, then it would provide a lot of housing without changing the nature of the neighborhood. The neighborhood would look better, not worse. And it wouldn't have a more uh, physical density. It's sort of horizontal distributed density rather than uh, focused uh, high-rise density. Um, you can, cars can park in the driveway after the conversion. And one thing I would recommend for um, um, Culver City is that the state vehicle code allows, that it prohibits parking on the street in front of a driveway. I mean, you wouldn't want to come out and find somebody parked on the street in front of your driveway, would you? So it's illegal, but it allows cities to issue permits to residents to block the, their own driveway, to parallel park on the street in front of their own driveway with the permit showing in the, in the um, uh, it, on, on your dashboard, so it gives you a, a guaranteed on-street space for the for the homeowner. You could use you could let uh, plumbers or electricians or housekeepers or anybody like that use it. Uh, so Culver City could do that, and I think that it would make it even more sensible to convert these garages um, into uh, uh, to housing. Um, because it's already part of the house, uh, you wouldn't have to add much for for air conditioning or heating or anything like that. You could connect to the main house. If it's a family member who lives there, they could uh, uh, get into the house. The fire engines and the ambulance wouldn't have any trouble getting to these uh, garages because they're right in front. And I think that the, 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 the garage residents will provide more eyes on the street and the homeowners can feel safer further away if somebody is living in the garage. And it isn't as though all these garages were full of cars. Um, that, uh, that the cars were already out of the garage and onto the driveway. Um, so cities can allow homeowners to swap their garages from storage for cars or old stuff into housing for people. Um, I think these garages are much more valuable now uh, for people than for cars. Uh, and I'm happy that the city is, is, is beginning to legalize it. Of course, they're only doing so because the state has forced them to do it. Uh, but I think that cities can do a lot on their own, uh, that, uh, that many cities are now eliminating all street parking requirements. It was unthinkable 10 or 15 years ago, but it's, it's happening now. Buffalo was the first big city to do it. And getting, instead of all those tables, like the ones you have in Culver City, it has one sentence. The provision of all street vehicle parking is not required. That's all it takes is, is to say, well, we made a mistake. Uh, that uh, we could get rid of it. Hartford, Connecticut, uh, eliminate all their minimum parking requirements. Minneapolis uh, removed all its minimum parking requirements <laughs> and went even further that every single family uh, zone lot now can have up to three housing units on it. San Francisco just removed all its parking requirements um, and so did San Diego within a half a mile of rail transit. 
well, why are these cities removing their off-street parking requirements? You know, naturally you have a Google or for anything you're interested in and want to find those parking requirements. So you get a lot of newspaper articles that say why cities are removing uh, 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 their parking requirements to allow more apartments or more affordable housing, um, and certainly to help businesses. Uh, businesses can open up even if they don't have five parking spaces per thousand square feet. Uh, um, and gives everybody more flexibility, and it makes the city look better. Well, what will happen if cities remove their parking requirements? I think um, uh, in Cisco, that uh, several of my students went up and took photographs of the parking lot. I later went and took these, these photographs of my own. It's a lovely area. Uh, it's a great place to live uh, uh, if you're a car. Uh, but how can we get rid of this mess if we could convert some of it to housing? Uh, well, I was speaking to the Congress for New Urbanism, so I photoshopped some buildings from London onto the periphery of that parking lot and said if we allowed it, um, city, the, the property owners could build apartment houses on the perimeter of their parking lots without, the, it's already under one ownership, there's no land assembly problem. Um, it's not brownfield. You wouldn't have to dig parking garage underneath it. They could park right behind the apartment. Uh, uh, the, I, I don't think that's what really would be uh, built. So I took some apartment buildings from downtown Los Angeles, looking a little bit more nondescript, but more likely what would happen. Uh, and if that turned out to be profitable, because uh, uh, the housing is a lot more valuable, I think, than empty parking spaces, you could build some more. It could be a gradual thing as it kept on going. This, this is what it looks like in downtown LA, and it could look something like this in San Jose. It looks like you were in a real city. If you were walking down the street, you would think this is, this is a, a really nice city. Uh, there's an uh, a elementary school on the ground floor of, of this uh, building at the corner. Uh, so uh, residents who, who uh, live there, they could uh, just walk across the parking lot to the Cisco uh, <laughs> office buildings. Um, and if they, um, if they live some, if work someplace else, they could drive uh, uh, to work and somebody else could park in their parking spot during the day. Uh, uh, well, how will, uh, how will this uh, removing apartment requirements affect employment in the area? You know, we can't import apartment buildings. Somebody will have to build it. There'll be many more jobs for uh, drywallers and architects and uh, electricians and roofers and, and everything associated with building housing. Uh, how would that affect wages and unemployment? Well, I think there are a lot of good effects uh, of this. Uh, all of them respond to common complaints. Uh, that it certainly create jobs. Uh, we can import gasoline in cars, but we cannot import apart em apartment buildings. Um, and it, um, uh, it certainly we want more housing that uh, allow that R job adjacent housing, just right where we need it. Um, and think of all the complaints about the, uh, the long commutes and traffic congestion, air pollution, and energy consumption. I think it would address a lot of these goals that, we, that we're trying to achieve. Um, uh, getting rid of parking requirements will contribute to solving every one of these problems. Um, and of course, it will affect climate change. But I don't think the way to, to slow climate change is to build a lot of parking. Um, so I recommend three basic reforms. Um, that uh, One is to charge the right prices for on-the-street parking. Um, uh, you can't remove the on-street parking requirements until you manage the on-street parking properly. Um, and what is the, the, the right price for curb parking? I think it's the lowest price the city can charge and still have one or two uh, open spaces on every block. So wherever you drive, you'll see a space waiting for you. It's just what you want to see, one or two open spaces. Um, and then to make that politically popular, some cities um, uh, dedicate the revenue uh, to pay for public services on the metered streets. If you have uh, parking meters, uh, you get the extra services. If you don't have parking meters, you don't get the extra services. Um, and that uh, uh, makes the transition to, to uh, uh, properly priced parking better. Say, car, uh, culver, um, say uh, 
Boulder, Colorado, which does a lot of things right, they use the parking meter revenue downtown to give a free transit pass to everybody who works downtown. It's a free fringe benefit for everybody who works downtown. And it doesn't cost the employer anything. Now, do you think that Boulder would be better off if they had free on-the-street parking and no parking passes for any employee? Or do you think it would be better to charge the lowest price the city can charge to get one or two open spaces and spend the money to uh, provide a free transit pass for everybody? I think it would work here in Culver City because you've got your own bus line. If you gave a, a free transit pass on the Culver City uh, buses for anybody who works um, in um, in the meter district, I think it would be a very good uh, policy. And then you could reduce uh, off-street parking requirements if you have the on-street parking managed properly. Uh, and that would allow all kinds of business to open up, restaurants and things like that. There, the, there would be no required parking for anybody. They can provide it. it does, ha, not having parking requirements doesn't mean you won't have parking. For, first, you start off from a situation where you have tons of parking everywhere. Um, and, but new developments will provide parking if they think that, they, that their customers will want it and be, are willing to pay for it. Um, so I think it's key to have these uh, 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 about 85% occupancy of the parking spaces, uh, uh, not more because then it will be hard to find a space to park and not less because the spaces will be not, not used and the businesses will lose customers and things like that. So it's the lowest price a city can charge. Um, and nobody can say that there's a shortage of parking, it's just that you can't say there's a shortage of Coca-Cola or cherries or, or or um, anything <laughs> that you otherwise buy. We don't think there's a shortage of, of anything in this country is except parking um, and housing. Um, and I think that it's, it's, it's a lot better than not being able to find a, a parking space. Uh, well, San Francisco is the first city that uh, tried this and they uh, uh, very wisely chose an urban designer to explain the problem, say that some spaces, some blocks have high, too high occupancy and some too low. Um, and they say, if we just nudge up the price on that top block and nudge it down on the bottom block, we could get this, uh, which is a lot better because there are more, more spaces used on the formerly under-occupied block. Um, and many, many people seem to think that charging fair market prices for curb parking requires some wrenching social change, almost as cataclysmic like the Reformation or Prohibition. Um, but it, it's really very small. If the city can't do that, what can it do? You know, what can society achieve if this is too big a, a lift for any city? Um, um, it's just simple like what you learn when you're a kid. It's the Goldilocks principle of parking prices. Um, not too hot, not too cold, not too soft, not too firm, not too high and not too low. Um, so here's the, it came from a study we did in Westwood Village. And so typically uh, in Westwood Village, the, 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 all the spaces are occupied most of the time, and there are about two cars uh, circling every block. Um, and uh, if you got, nudge the prices up, you could get, um, and the average uh, 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 cruising time before parking was about a little over three minutes, uh, which doesn't seem like that much, about half a mile. Uh, but when you add it all up, it was, uh, in a year, it was equal to about 900,000 vehicle miles, which is equivalent to four trips to the moon in Little Westwood Village. So whenever you're in Westwood Village, it looks like there's a lot of traffic. Much of that is people hunting for an underpriced curb parking space, or at least it was then. Uh, they also uh, 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 had a, a wonderful video that uh, explained uh, uh, what uh, what they were going to do. Uh, if you're interested in dynamic parking prices, uh, and I, I'm not in favor of prices that change every day or, or, or by the hour, but here's what they do. I think it only takes two minutes, but it explains everything you need to know about dynamic parking prices. Finding a parking space can be frustrating and time it's estimated most of the third city traffic is caused by drivers circling while looking for space. Some drivers just give up and double park. This clogs our streets and needlessly pollutes the air. 
these cars slow down public transit and get in the way of an energy benefit. And drivers focused on buying parking create a hazard for pedestrians and cyclists. There is a better way. San Francisco is testing new parking technology and a flexible approach to pricing that is designed to make parking work better for everyone. That's at Park's goal to have at least one parking space available per block. That way, drivers can park near a specific destination without the need to circle the block or double park. This also provides a steady flow of customers for business owners. SF Park provides safer and clearer streets for everyone. Here's how it works. New installed parking sensors detect when a parking space is available. Drivers will be able to check parking availability in rates online, by text message, and by smartphone before heading to their destination. This will help you decide whether to drive, take public transit, bike, or walk. When people choose to drive, new SF Park meters will make paying easier. In addition to taking coins, the new meters will accept credit cards and SF MGA parking cards. Parking time limits will be extended. Easier payment and extended time limits will help drivers avoid tickets. Prices at city-owned parking garages will be adjusted to provide an attractive alternative to meet the parking. Parking rates will be adjusted based on demand, once a month, never by more than 50 cents. So, in areas where it seems nearly impossible to find a parking space, rates will increase until at least one space is available most of the time. And in areas where open parking spaces are comfortable, rates will decrease until most of the empty space is filled, or until rates bottom out at as little as 25 cents per hour. <laughs> SF Park is designed to ensure that drivers easily find an open space near their destination. SF Park will help people plan ahead. Well, well, the average meter prices declined with SF Park. Um, uh, that took 10, they, they changed prices every three months, so it took 10 price changes for about three years. Um, and uh, surprisingly, uh, only nine blocks reached the cap that they placed on it as uh, $6 an hour. Uh, and many more had fallen to the minimum price they charged of 25 cents an hour. Why is that? Because if you have the same price all day long, it's going to be too high at some times and too low at others. And it was far too high in the morning. And I think that it really should be free if there's, no, if there's still empty spaces when the, when the, when the uh, uh, price is zero. So uh, I think that the, 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 this performance pricing or dynamic pricing leads to changes only uh, if the prices are so low that no spaces are open. Um, and greenhouse gas emissions declined by 30% uh, uh, in the pilot area. They, they had a pilot area with 7,000 meters. They had a control area where almost nothing changed to show that this big change came from uh, reducing, uh, uh, charging the right price for curb parking. And double parking declined. They had a lot of evidence showing that as soon as the um, uh, occupancy reaches around 100%, there's a lot of double parking. So you just have to provide a few parking uh, curb occupancy openings and there won't be much uh, 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 double parking, which slows down the bus travel, uh, and there won't be that many tickets. Um, and importantly, the uh, sales tax revenue in the pilot area increased. That is, after you started charging these market prices for parking, the way you can measure how it affects business is to look at the sales tax revenue. And the sales tax revenue went up much more in the, in the control, in the, in the pilot area than in the patrol, uh, control area. Um, well, some people think this was so, so difficult to do because their image of a parking meter is like this initial one, the first one in the world in 1935 in, 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 in um, Oklahoma City. And, but it functionally different, the same as almost all parking meters <laughs> in most cities, is that you put your money in uh, and hope to get back uh, before your time runs out. I mean, how many, uh, how many payment systems have not changed in this country since 1935? Um, uh, when, it was put, when it was started, people thought this was a terrible idea. It was like an infernal combination of a, a slot machine and an alarm clock. You're always taking chances. But uh, the technology in recent years has gotten much better, and in most cities, much better than, than most cities have adopted, yeah. 
here, here's a parking meter on, on campus, um, and it doesn't even tell you, it's a multi-space meter, it controls several spaces, it doesn't even tell you what the price is until you touch any button, and then it tells you what the price is at that time. You could see me reflected <laughs> in the, as I'm taking that, it's $3 for the first hour and $4 for the second hour. Uh, that seems like a lot to charge students. It's right uh, uh, next to the, the uh, law library and the law school. Uh, Murphy Hall is in the distance. So I, I think a lot of you suspect that professors have a lot of spare time on their hands. Um, uh, so I set myself up with my tripod and camera and I took pictures every four minutes of these eight spaces, which is a typical number of spaces on a street when it's parallel parking, but these are diagonal parking. And I think this picture here is when I started taking the picture. This is what you want to see. It's a pretty well occupied, but one open space. So you see somebody usually walking to pay at the meter. So here's four minutes later. Uh, the two cars on the end never moved uh, during the hour because you can park for more than two hours. But usually when one car left, another car arrived. Uh, sometimes there was, there was one time there was only, there were no open spaces. Very quickly there were the new open space, new open space. Sometimes there were two open spaces. Um, uh, but usually people were coming and going and there was all, almost always a space uh, available. Um, which is, there, there were three spaces available there, I guess. That, that was the only time that that happened. Uh, so I think that uh, this is what you want to see. And is this what a, a typical block looks like in Culver City? If you're a merchant looking out at the block of parking spaces in front of your store, is there usually one open space? Is it usually almost always full? That's what you want for a prosperous city, and especially that it would be uh, generating revenue as well. So I, I think um, the right price is you can just you could, the only way you can tell what's the right price is by looking at the results. Uh, should the prices be higher here? No, I don't think so, uh, because there's almost always a space. Should they be lower? Well, I don't think so, because then there wouldn't be spaces. Uh, the, the right price for, for parking is rather like the Supreme Court's definition of pornography, is I know it when I see it, that until you see one or two open spaces usually available, that you know the price is not right. Um, uh, can anybody think of a better way to set the price of, of, of curb parking? And when you ask anybody in a city, well, why is the price $2 an hour here and why is it end at 6 o'clock? They can't tell you. There's no principle that they use. Um, well, I think we all want to park free, including me, and that will never change. Um, but I think parking wants to be paid for. Uh, that it, it's different from information, which has a very low cost uh, once it's there for everybody to use it. That's not, the, that's not what it's like for parking. Usually if you get the price wrong for, for, for parking, you get a lot of cruising, cruising around hunting for a vacant space. Uh, there's a list of, I think, uh, 21 studies and 13 cities on four continents um, uh, of, of cruising for parking. Uh, appropriately, the first study was done in, in Detroit in 1927. But they found that where they looked, they found about a third of the cars in traffic were cruising for parking. It took seven and a half minutes to find a curb space. This doesn't represent all, all, all driving, of course. It's only where you, where you expect cruising, and that's where you study cruising, you expect to find it. Here was a nice study in, in Chicago, um, just before World War II, that they stationed uh, people at every intersection with uh, very accurate watches, and, copy down the license plate number of every car that passed an intersection, whether it turned left or right or went straight ahead, what the time was, so they could recreate the path of travel. Uh, some people just insisted on uh, one parking, you know, they, they were determined to live there, to, to park there, but other people were more open to new things and trying something different. Um, but there's a lot of pollution and, 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 and congestion caused by that. And it's no fun, uh, if whatever you're doing it, uh, and we all have done it, that it seems like that you're trying to, f to not be right behind the car in front of you because if there's a space, that car will get it. So you want to go slow, and, and then you see in the mirror behind you, just if you pass, there was somebody who's got a space. And this leads to very dangerous behavior. So I've seen cars 
make a U-turn in, in the middle of the block if they see a space on the other side. Here's grainy uh, 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 footage of one of these, uh, the most dangerous one I ever saw. I was able to, to interview the driver uh, after she uh, got out of the car, and she does. She says she does whatever it takes to find a curb parking space in Culver City. Well, if we begin to pay more attention to the uh, to the curb spaces, there are a lot of other uses for it other than parking. They can be loading zones. We now have. Um, uh, uh, a lot of Uber and Lyft who are picking up people and dropping them off, and now they have to do it in the traffic lane. In, in, in many cases, over half of the time on a busy street like, like Washington Avenue, there'll be somebody double parked, an Uber or a Lyft double parked, and somebody getting in and out of the car in traffic, which is not very safe, but it also slows down all the, uh, the it's like having a double parked car in the street that we could have longer bus stops, there could be no stopping zones, um, bike lanes. Uh, uh, I, one of my favorites is outdoor restaurants that, um, that's getting, uh, in this climate, it's just terrific that uh, some cities put their street trees and, and the parking spaces in the curb lane instead of empty cars. And it draws more visitors and earns more money and um, employs more people. And then bike stations are very, very uh, appropriate, I think, that usually when anybody wants to take away curb parking spaces to put in a bike station, they'll be crying saying, well, you're taking away our precious parking spaces. What about, what about drivers? You're neglecting them. Uh, well, a very clever guy <laughs> took a, 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 a film of uh, two sides of Broadway in New York, and they took away three parking spaces on the left to make a bike station. <laughs> they have three cars on the other side. And, and during the hour, you can tell by this that there were 200 people who arrived or departed from the, from the uh, bike station and 11 people who arrived or departed in cars. So it's hard to think that, that the, in that place at that time, the parking was a more productive use of the land than, uh, than that, uh, uh, that bike station. Another thing that I would recommend for, um, uh, for any city, including Culver City, is that there are a lot of, uh, of required parking spaces at bars and banks and things like that. When they're closed, they're not available to the public. Um, and some businesses found a way to convert their private lots with free parking for customers into paid lots open to the public when the business is closed. It's an easy and cheap way to provide more parking without building any more parking spaces. So they can have, here's one in San Diego, that, uh, that you uh, can burn, you pay at the meter uh, when the bank is closed uh, and the customers can park free when the, when the, when the bank is open. So that provides, uh, at no cost to the city, it provides more uh, parking. Uh, another thing you could do is that instead of having time limits uh, for curb parking uh, at the meter, uh, you can instead Remove the time limits and let prices create the desired turnover. Here it says Albany had been charging $1.25 an hour with a maximum of two hours. And then they said, well, we'll take away the maximum, but if you want to park longer, you have to start paying a higher price for every subsequent hour. Um, and uh, uh, after it changed to progressive prices, um, the, uh, the revenue went up uh, and the turnover um, uh, increased and the the, um, uh, there were fewer tickets for parking violations. Uh, another uh, policy I like um, that uh, certainly works here in California is uh, progressive parking fines to deter, to deter repeat violators. In almost every city, uh, a few um, people get multiple tickets during the year. Uh, and most people get no tickets or, or one or, or, or one ticket. Anybody can, you know, you can make a mistake and uh, you didn't intend to, to, to not to pay. Uh, but uh, what cities have done, like Los Angeles, I don't know about uh, Culver City, but they have high fines for, for parking meter violations, which is very difficult for a low-income person to pay. You know, that it's, uh, it's, it's a very 
it, it, can, it can be a, a very, a create a hardship. If you have a high enough fine to deter the repeat violators, it's unfair to the occasional violators. So here's what, uh, Claremont, California was the first city to do this in California, but you can see that, that you know, to show that the city is not trying to just make money, that your first violation of the year is, is a warning, and then the next one is minor, and then the, the first, <laughs> but it keeps on going up. Um, it could be higher than that, and the fines are higher in Claremont, but the idea is that to deter repeat violators, you have to um, uh, increase the fine for subsequent violations. Um, and one uh, policy that I think would be <laughs> good for Culver City or, or any other city that has a lot of uh, uh, attractions for people to come into the city is to give parking discounts for residents. See, in Miami Beach, was <laughs> perfect example of this, the, the, uh, uh, the non-residents pay $4 an hour at the meter. The meter just says $4 an hour. They think everybody pays that. But if your license plate is registered in Miami Beach, you only pay a dollar an hour. So it's a, it's a, it's a discount that is given uh, sort of under the table. Uh, rather like so many things that cities do, they have a, a high tax on um, uh, car rental at the airports because it seems as though or, or uh, high tax on hotels. It seems as though the, the, the non-residents are paying it all. It's like Monty Python's idea for uh, solving Britain's problems was to tax foreigners living abroad. And I think uh, parking meters with, with resident discounts uh, achieve that effect, uh, rather like hotel taxes. And most tourists expect to pay for parking. Say, I would have paid for parking when I came here, but I got free parking uh, right in this building. And should please the merchants, uh, uh, who could encourage the residents to shop locally and uh, maybe it would even reduce vehicle travel if more people began to shop close to home. And um, Monterey gives the first two hours free in the, in, the, in the city garages. Culver City could do that very easily. Uh, if they have to raise the price of parking in the garages, they could do two things. is raise the price but give a resident discount, either in the rate or the first two hours or something. Uh, Calgary gives a, a discount for smaller cars at parking meters, that if you have a car less than you know, 12 and a half feet long or something like that, you've got a 25% discount. Um, uh, and Madrid, and I hope this will ca ca catch on, they give discount for, for, for uh, low polluting cars. So if you have two cars, <laughs> one's higher polluting than the other, it would encourage you to drive the low pollution car or to buy a low pollution car. Um, so it would get away from the idea that all the parking meter money is wasted. Uh, so I think to show that the money is not wasted, some cities uh, create parking benefit districts that use the money to pay for added public services like free transit passes for everybody in the meter district. Uh, uh, normally when you put money into a meter, it might as well go pay for the Iraq war or Afghanistan or something like that. There, there's no detectable benefit to you. And the planners seem like the most evil people, that whenever anything parking is taken away is because it's a war on cars. Um, uh, but I think that, uh, that um, when people get the money for parking, they understand uh, that charging for curb parking is not un-American. Uh, I think it is very American to charge people for, for what they use. Uh, here's a seat of the neighborhood around the Coliseum during the 1984 Olympics, but it happens around any event uh, at, the, at the Coliseum that the residents park their own cars on the street and rent out their, their driveways to, uh, to ticket holders. Uh, I think that, that once people understand that they are benefiting from the money, they will uh, understand that charging, for, <laughs> charging uh, foreigners living abroad for parking is not a bad idea. And it worked very well in Pasadena. It was the first city in California to try this. It, many of you are, not all of you, but many of you are too young to realize that, that um, uh, old Pasadena used to be a commercial skid row uh, with a lot of empty storefronts and everything above the first floor unused and nobody wanted to go there. Here's what it looks like now. It's one of the most popular places to go in, in Southern California. People, uh, 30,000 people, go there just to walk around the sidewalks every weekend. Well, what happened? Um, well, the city wanted to put in parking meters. The city had no parking meters. 
Um, and the merchant said, no way, especially with the few customers we have. And all, all the merchants and their employees parked on the street and moved their cars every two hours and complained there wasn't enough parking. Um, but when the city offered to return all the revenue uh, to fix up old Pasadena, they had a vision of what they would like to be, rather like you know, uh, Culver City had. Uh, that, uh, that they, they knew what they wanted, but they didn't have the money to pay for it. And they said, well, once the, once the, the uh, city said, we'll return the money to you, the merchant, the merchant, well, that's different. Why didn't you tell us that? Let's run their meters to midnight. Let's run, run them on Sunday. Let's charge a high price. And the only thing that changed is the city said that this is what the meter money will go to pay for. Um, so the, the meter operate till midnight and, and on Sunday, and they get over a uh, million dollars a year. That's about $80,000 per block. Um, uh, and here was an interview with, uh, they had a, 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 a created a nexus between the, the meters and the policy that they had a, appointed a, a, an advisory board. And here's a quote from one of the, 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 the leaders of the advisory board. Uh, the, when we figured out that the money would stay here, that the money would be used to improve the amenities, it was an easy sell. And I think if the merchants in any part of Culver City knew that they got at least a share of the money, that they would be much more uh, eager to, to, to enforce the, <laughs> the meters, for one thing, because if you're, if you're parking without paying, you're stealing money from the business district. Um, so I think that, the, that they, and they put up slogans saying turning small change into big changes. And uh, you can see that, uh, that there, was a, there, there was a huge difference between before and after. That, um, that uh, historic preservation is very expensive and it didn't pay before the city really fixed up everything in the public sector, which only the city can do. But once the public sector had done its part, um, uh, then, uh, then the private operators uh, followed suit. Uh, here was an, an empty uh, uh, tire warehouse. Uh, it had been empty for, for many years. became a department store. It's not, the right, it's not even on Colorado Boulevard. It's not the right place for a Saks Fifth Avenue. It's now uh, Forever 21, which is where I want to buy my clothes. But, um, uh, and uh, the, the woman who was the, uh, managing this transformation uh, Marsha Rood later came to work here in Culver City, and she managed the revival, I think, of downtown Culver City. So there's one woman who was responsible for a lot of the good things you can see in, in, in Pasadena and Culver City. And there were these uh, dirty alleys, like alleys in the rest of the city, that there were mattresses and dead animals. Uh, and then they uh, used the meter money to fix up these alleys and make them uh, you know, wonderful areas for, 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 for walking, and they have outdoor restaurants in them. So this is uh, what it is now. This was a commercial slum 35 years ago. Uh, uh, and the uh, tax revenues started shooting up in 1993 when they put in the parking meters. Nobody can say these parking meters did any, <laughs> any harm because it was... It, it came from such a low base, and then it, it, who, who would have, among your old timers, who would have thought that old, this commercial skid row would overtake um, South Lake Avenue, which is where the boats, Wilshire was there, all the, the best stores and things like that. Um, and now uh, South Lake Avenue has copied uh, old Pasadena. So I think that these parking benefit districts, they're, they're a transportation management tool to reduce cruising and um, traffic congestion and air pollution, that's one of their roles. But I think they're almost their most important role is an economic development tool because it provides money for things that the city would like to do. Um, uh, so I think that, uh, that the, the, there's a lot of good jobs, just as I said it would in, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. It, 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 you could do it here, and it would have these, these effects. Plus, it would yield money. Um, and, um, and I think it appeals to uh, uh, people across the political spectrum, uh, whether you're on the left or the right. These ideas should have a lot of appeal. Uh, let me just try to explain that. That um, 
we have these three policies of getting, have, charge the right price for curb parking and spend the revenue in the meter districts and get rid of all street parking requirements, that liberals uh, will see there's more money for public services. You want that, don't you? And conservatives see that well, this is, relies on markets, the magic of markets. Um, and it reduces government regulation of parking requirements. Environmentalists have a lot to gain from this, that, um, that uh, almost all of their goals are going to be helped by getting rid of minimum parking requirements and getting rid of cruising. And businesses will see that they can open stores without having to deal with the planning department saying, well, where is the required parking? Well, you have to pay the in-lieu fee or you have to do something else or share your parking. They can just open a restaurant if they want to open a restaurant. Um, if they meet all the health code regulations, things like that. And the new urbanist will see that you could, you could live at higher density without being overrun by, by cars. Um, all, all, all parking is political, and all the prospects for parking reform depend on what the political context allows. Um, libertarians have a lot to benefit from this. Uh, that rely more on individual choice. Uh, people who, who emphasize property rights, that the, the, the city has been infringing on my property rights. It takes away a huge burden on property rights. Uh, developers will certainly see that they won't have to deal with the city saying, counting every parking space and making sure that it exists. The, the planners could pay more attention to whether the uh, uh, services for disabled drivers is better or the appearance is better. Uh, and making sure that the entry and exit is on the right street. Um, and the residents have a lot to benefit from, from this because they get better neighborhood public services. Certainly it will help affordable housing uh, because you, the affordable housing developer will only have to put in as much parking as they think that should be uh, uh, enough for all the residents. So they can charge separately for the parking. You won't. You won't rent housing and in, with it comes two, two parking spaces in, in, in the basement, you'll rent housing and if, you want, and if you want parking, you'll pay for parking. So some people, they can have, if they have three cars, they can pay for three parking spaces. If you don't have any car, you can buy more housing. I think that would be much better. Uh, and the neighborhood activists, instead of attacking City Hall, they can start thinking about how to improve their own neighborhood. Uh, uh, and I think the local elected officials will, will be the greatest beneficiaries. I don't know if you put your, your council meetings on the, uh, on, on the web or on the radio, but uh, I used to listen to the Santa Monica ones. And it, the meetings would go on past midnight, arguing whether we should increase the price of parking by 25 cents an hour. You know, there'd be probably, you know, I'm sure that in Culver City you have very aggrieved citizens who want to be heard. Uh, but it was just appalling to think of how much time was spent about parking. What will we do with all the cars we won't need? Oh, well, here's a, a, a sculpture in France called Long Term Parking. <laughs> uh, uh, what about all the garages that we have, have built? What will we use them for? Here's a repurposing that I like. Uh, um, well, I think nobody can end the planning talk uh, with anything better than Jane Jacobs. Um, uh, we're not a wealthy country because of what you and I have done. We live in a wealthy country because we were born here or, or, or moved here, and we know a lot to the past. Um, and I think that we haven't been making enough gifts to the future. Um, uh, uh, here's a quote from uh, Dwight Eisenhower on this issue in his famous farewell address when he talked about the military-industrial complex. Um, it, we seem to be plundering the resources to tomorrow at a rate that President Eisenhower could not have conceived, going into huge amounts of debt, building an immense amount of parking, um, uh, maybe even imperiling the planet uh, with our, uh, with our uh, overuse of automobiles. And of course, our greatest uh, presidential writer was Abraham Lincoln, and I think our case is due, and I think it's time to think anew about parking and to act anew about it. You, you probably don't often hear a professor ending a lecture with quotes from two Republican presidents in Los Angeles, but I suspect that all our presidents um, would, would, would agree with this, uh, almost all. Um, uh, 
And I think paradigm shifts in, in planning are, are, are often barely noticeable where they're happening, and after it's hard to tell that anything has changed. We used to think that urban renewal was the main thing to do, tear down housing, uh, and build anew. Well, now we have historic preservation. We make a U-turn that is so fast, we don't remember we were going in another direction. And I hope that will be the same with uh, off-street parking requirements. But no matter what we do, I think the, the parking problem will all be, always be with us unless technology uh, moves faster. Um, General Motors is working on a new idea that I think will, will renew the, the uh, American automobile industry and solve the parking problem. There's some grainy footage of what it looks like. Well, until then, I think uh, that, that, that all of you will have a lot of work ahead of you. So I think that parking is free for most cars, but housing is expensive for most people, um, as suggested by this familiar image of the Monopoly board. You have to pay if you're going to stop at a, at a hotel or a house, but you can park for free. I think we have our priorities exactly the wrong way around. Cities have made great mistakes in planning uh, for parking, and you could help to correct it. I think uh, uh, reform depends on leadership from all of you, and I think, as I remember from the campaign slogan of your mayor, I would say, when it comes to parking, think small. Um, well, that's about all I know, so I better stop. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you. You have two minutes. <laughs> I don't think so. No, I, I, I think the mass transit will help, uh, but old Pasadena thrived before there was any mass transit. I think that, uh, that in any case, I don't think you'll get a wonderful mass transit system if you continue building plenty of off street, requiring plenty of off street parking and leaving curb parking free. That's not the context for a great mass transit system. That your policies are making sure that we will never have a, at least the riders, we may, we may, spend an infinite amount of money on, on transit, but what we lack in Los Angeles is transit riders. And I think everything that I've been talking about will, will increase transit ridership. Mm -hmm. it'll, it'll help us take advantage of the investments we've already made. Thank you. Hi. Uh, great speech, great talk. Uh, and I've become a conscious, I've lived here for 17 years in Culver City, and. I first moved here and were involved in meetings. I uh, used to say, you know, we need more parking, and now it's, you know, it's like no parking. Now you build a building, no parking. So I'm a kind well, of... Well, all I'm saying, we'll allow it to happen. That, that's the only thing you have to do is to allow it. I doubt if many buildings will be built without any parking. Right. I think not many developers will think that's a good idea. If they, they have to worry about their tenants and the tenants' customers. So I think there's a huge difference between saying that we're going to get rid of parking requirements mm -hmm. and getting rid of parking. Right. And some people think that, oh, getting rid of parking requirements, that's a war on cars. It is not. It's like saying if we had, a, ha had a, a requirement that everybody had to eat 10 hamburgers a week. Mm -hmm. And then we repealed that. They said, that's a war on hamburgers. Mm -hmm. There won't be enough hamburgers. You know, the, no, I think that, that we've just made a huge mistake. and that. And that, um, and that we have a wonderful future when we stop making that mistake. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to ask, from more specifically, was there was an app called, I think it was called Park Mobile. Yeah. Uh -huh. Remember that? It's and still going. Because you don't, I, I saw it in DC years ago, and then we had it here, I think, in Santa Monica, mm -hmm. and now it doesn't seem like it's, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It still works. 
Oh, the company is still a very. Okay, because I love that idea of being able to. You could you could go. You could put, if you're going somewhere, you could put in uh, an hour. You know mm -hmm. how long you're going to be, and then if you on your phone, you realize you're going to be more. You could use your. And phone. And that's already very old-fashioned. I think we'll look <laughs> back at that the way we look back at a 1935 parking meter. Is that. Uh, Already some cars have that, that, that app built into the dash for the car. The car knows where it is and it's <laughs> more connected than you are. So whenever you arrive at the curb and you, could, and you want to park, you just touch a button on the dash and it starts paying for parking at that point and it stops paying when the car pulls out. The car knows it has left yeah. the space. So you won't have to get out your cell phone or look at anything like that and the app's already if you wanted to come to this meeting, you would key in your address and it'll take you to the parking space right away. It'll give you turn by turn instructions and then it will pay for the parking. So I think that won't be long before we have it. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the, these things get adopted in BMWs and uh, Mercedes, but then all cars will have it because it's so easy to do. Mm -hmm. It's just an app. Yeah. Uh, but the, the idea of not saying I'm going to commit, I'm going to pay for an hour, you don't won't have to do that. You'll, it'd be like a, a long distance telephone call that you pay for. As soon as you hang up, right. you stop paying. Right. That you pay for exactly what you use, and you won't hang around because you've already paid for parking. But I think that. Uh, Certainly, the, the technology is moving so fast. Even that will seem primitive at some stage. I, if any of you parked at Century City, the, they've already started doing that. You, 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 um, uh, when you go in, you pull a ticket, and then you pay it. Uh, you pay it the, at the uh, kiosk when you go. But when you drive down, you don't insert your card. The gate just goes up because they have recognized your license plate and your card that you paid for. <laughs> said that this license plate has paid for yeah, parking. We have that. We actually, we have that here. Yeah, we do, we do. Well, see, that's just parking. the way the world is moving. Yeah. Is that it, there'll be less to do, but so soon you won't be able. To, you won't need to pull a, 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 car, a car when you when you drive in. But it will rely on the fact that everybody should pay for their parking. Okay. Thank you. On the other side. I'm sorry. I'm so, oh, you go. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> I really enjoy your presentation, um, and uh, it seems like you've done some study of Culver City and the situation here. Uh, I was wondering, and this might intrude on a possibly future consultancy, but if you had the power to implement things, what would the first three things you would do in Culver City? Well, the three things that I mentioned, <laughs> I would try to uh, get the price of curb parking right. Uh, I, it, it may require more meters running longer hours. Um, I would uh, spend some of that money to really uh, um, be ostentatious about the use of the revenue. Asking people, what is it you most want in your neighborhood and here's a way to pay for it. Do you want to charge for parking and there's a way to pay for this? Um, and. Uh, could, uh, some cities give free Wi-Fi to everybody on the meter streets. Um, uh, and then I would uh, remove all street parking requirements. Those are the three things. The, 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 and, uh, I think that and what's easiest to do would be remove all street parking requirements, just say that <laughs> there's no parking required for any building. Um, and it would save the planning department an awful lot of time arguing with people and giving variances and things like that, uh, that the, you already have some parking meters that just, they'll, they'll be getting better. Most, some cities, I think the world is moving to paying for parking by your license plate. So you can give resident discounts. I think if you want to make it politically possible, I'd say we're giving resident discounts in our, our, at the curb and in our garages. Uh, because uh, pol policy is not formulated, it's negotiated. Uh, and academics can formulate any kind of, like I do, <laughs> say this is a good policy. But that's not how they get adopted. They have to have supporters, they have to have champions. And you have very good elected leadership here in, 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 in Culver City, and I hope that I've just given them some cover to say that, well, <laughs> uh, that, uh, it's not crazy. I, well, when I started talking about this, half the planning profession thought I was crazy and the other half thought I was daydreaming. But I think now I have the right story for the right time. Uh, and um, uh, everybody 
uh, uh, unless they want to be, be exposed as a total hypocrite, uh, it would be hard for people to say we want to have these goals of reduced carbon emissions and, <laughs> and air pollution, and we want to have minimum parking requirements and free curb parking. Another one for me, sorry. Um, I actually live in London, part of the room. I've been doing it for 20 years, and one of the things I've seen happening over the last 20 years is high streets where, we, where you used to go to buy all your product, you couldn't find parking anymore, so most of those larger merchants couldn't stay there anymore, and it became a real issue. You couldn't get a car in there, you couldn't, so ultimately all the, the bigger um, manufacturers are having to move out from the high streets, and they became barren. Do you think that'd be a similar problem we'd have here if the parking was too much here in Culver City and people just couldn't come in? Because I don't come to the center with my car very much here because of the parking. Well, I think uh, people won't, uh, many people seem to think that not having free parking is the same thing as not having parking. Mm -hmm. But it's not. <laughs> you can't say there's no parking when there's, when there's garages all over the place. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, people would just have to get used to uh, paying for parking. We didn't become a great nation by being a bunch of freeloaders, except for parking. We think that we can freeload on parking, and that, that doesn't conflict with everything else we know about how the world works. Uh, that we have hidden the cost of parking. Uh, you know, in economics, they have the principle of the, of the invisible hand. Is the, the, you, the butcher and the baker don't provide the, the meat and the bread to you f for your interest, it's for their interest. Well, in planning, we don't have any similar theoretical explanation of what's happening, but what we do have is the hiding hand. We can hide the cost of parking in higher rents for housing and higher rents for commerce and higher costs for everything. We have hidden that cost in everything else we buy. And we wonder why do we have all this traffic congestion and air pollution? Well, it's because our planning has been profoundly mistaken for 70 or 80 years. Well, maybe I'm all worn out. I think <laughs> one more question. <laughs> I'm not sure how this is going to, as I'm trying to think about your suggestions, the question of accessibility mm -hmm. has to be addressed. So making more parking somewhere and cheaper rates for the parking lots and things like that. Um, for people who can't walk long distances, mm -hmm. for instance, but they can drive a car, mm -hmm. but the parking lot is where you have to go is five blocks away mm -hmm. from where you need to go. Mm -hmm. And you can't really get there that easily. Well, uh, in our current laws, if you have a disabled parking placard, you can park free at the curb wherever you go. Yeah. Okay. But I've, I'm sure you know of problems with that because there's so much placard abuse. Exactly. Okay, well, I have the solution for that too. Uh, the, 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 that I think is one of the most outrageous um, practices of this country, this state, not every, California is the worst state of all is that they've expanded the, the, uh, the issuance of disabled placards, so now 10% of all drivers have disabled placards, even though they don't have a severe mobility impairment. And, um, and there's a lot of fake, faking use of placards. So what Michigan and Illinois have done, I think they, they, they were just the way we are now, is that the, you can go whole blocks in downtown LA where every car has a disabled placard. Uh, why would you want to pay for parking downtown if you had a placard? 40% of all the placards, of all the cars parked in Westwood Village have a disabled placard. Mm. And we know that a lot of that is fake because the Business Improvement District has you know, these ambassadors that roam around, they clean things and advise people. And one of their ambassadors used a disabled placard to park at meters uh, in, in Westwood Village. And the bid tried to dissuade this person from doing it. So you're taking away uh, parking space all day long that could be used by customers. The only thing they could get the guy to do was to, to use the placard in the next 
the nearby permit parking district rather than in the village. That's, 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 that's an achievement in Los Angeles. So what, what Michigan and Illinois did is they had the same problem. Michigan was the first. They said, we're going to have two kinds of placards. One for people with severe mobility impairments. You know, they can't walk more than 30 or 40 feet. They have a wheelchair. Their doctor has certified that these the people has any disorder that means that they really need uh, uh, free parking at placards. So, and then everybody, all the other placards remain unchanged. You can park at Ralph's or, or any place else on disabled placard spaces, but you can't park free at meters unless you have the special placard that shows that you have a mobility impairment that is serious enough. And I guess when Michigan started this, they required everybody who had a placard, they had to reapply if they wanted the, the uh, mobility impairment uh, special placard. Guess what percentage of the people who had placards applied for a severe disability placard? 2%. 2%. So you must be very fed up with what we have now. And I think the one way to get around that is to adopt a two-tier placard system. The city of LA, uh, it, it's hard to, to because of this, some people in the disabled community want to have their free parking pass. It's, like, it's, a, it's a permit to park free anywhere, anytime, for as long as you want. Of course that'll be abused. Uh, so it's been hard to get cities to say, we want to do this. But I, getting back to your point, I think everything I've said is consistent with um, uh, if it better for people with disabilities. Because wherever you went, you would always see one or two open spaces, and you would have a free parking placard for that. But if you don't have a mobility impairment, you could park there too, but you'd have to pay. Does that make sense? It does, but part of what I'm also, I'm trying to think of what we currently have in terms of like parking structures and how you get from one place to another. So one thought I had was that the city, the city started providing occasional shuttles mm -hmm. to get people who have some disability from the parking structure to wherever the other place is, mm -hmm. and the parking structure gets used, it gets paid for, and... You mean the people would have to pay for it? <laughs> with, with severe mobility disability, no, you want no, them to... No, no, like mm -hmm. for instance, like mm -hmm. me. Yeah. Okay, I then, can't walk more than two oh, blocks. Then you would be guaranteed a curb <laughs> space wherever you went for free. Mm -hmm. I don't see how that could be in any way a problem for, for people with mobility impairments. I, your life would be better off if there weren't these people who were using their grandmother's placards. <laughs> yes, I see it all the time. I see it all the time. Yeah, it, it's, it's everywhere. It, it's an outrage that is somehow we just pay no attention to. We know what's happening. But I'm also talking about trying to provide something for people who say, no more cruising, except if you're in a shuttle going up and down the street. Well, that's right, okay. I think so. I, but, it's but, sort of like Disneyland. Well, in the parking benefit district, some of them use the money to have shuttle buses, if they think that's a good oh, idea. Oh, but oh, I think when you get rid of parking requirements, that they, you should still leave, make sure that there is disabled parking on site. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay, here's somebody. I have to ask one last thing. Oh, oh good. I, yes. Lovely ideas. What are we doing except promoting a continuation of our class system? If you don't have money, how do you park to get into your work? Please, you can. You don't have to. Oh, I, I don't need that. I yes, that. I, I think that um, the, for for most people in the United States, they, for most people in the United States, they get employer-paid parking. Just like people at this school who work here, they get free parking. Most people get free parking at work. And I, for, when I first got interested in parking, it, it came because I was asked about the equity issue in parking. This was 1975. The California Transportation Commission asked me to write about equity in transportation. And one of the things I noticed was employer paid parking. And I thought, this is unfair because it gives free parking to drivers and nothing to anybody else. 
If you get employer paid parking and you ride the bus, what do you get? You get nothing. Suppose you walk, you get nothing. If you carpool, well, you, you share the, 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 the free parking. But, but I, think, I thought this was very unfair that we give a subsidy to the richer people. More, the, 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 um, when you look at who drives to work, the higher your income, the more likely you are to drive to work. If you're a woman or a, minor, a minority, you're less likely to drive to work. So we have a system of free parking that creates a lot of traffic congestion and air pollution, and it helps most people, but it does not help people who don't drive to work. So if your focus is on people who drive to work, you ought to uh, support another, uh, you know, I have an endless number of reforms, it's called parking cash out. It's a state law that if you offer somebody a parking subsidy, and they don't drive to work, you have to offer that person the cash value of the subsidy. So if you, if you, are, if you are low income and you're offered free parking and you can't afford a car, how will you benefit from employer paid parking, from free parking? You can't benefit if you can't afford a car. The only way you can afford a car is, uh, the only way you can benefit from it is to buy a car, which now low income people do with title loans, the most awful kind of invention that we have now, high subprime auto loans. Because we are such an auto oriented society, you need a car to get most places, except not everybody has a car. So I think parking cash out is my answer to you, is that if you're going to subsidize anybody by, with, 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 with free parking, we ought to say that everybody else has to get the same benefit. Well, that, <laughs> and you, well, and you, really, you really, employers worshiping you on hmm? your, What's that? The employers will worship you. <laughs> they you, won't. They're already. <laughs> well, it's a state law. That, that's right. It's a reform. I'm saying that I, I should think you should support that reform. Is that we should not say that an employer can, can tell you if you're an employee, I'll give you free parking or nothing. But maybe that's what the city does. I, I bet there are a lot of employers in Culver City who do that. Santa Monica enforces the law. Culver City doesn't enforce the law. That's another thing that Culver City could do. Okay, well, <laughs> I am worn out and I, well, is there one, one more, more question? question and then we do have to close after the night. My, my question was um, related. Um, I, the only concern I have is about people that struggle financially. Yes. Uh -huh. um, uh, the example you gave of, of um, employees it certainly is not true in Culver City. There are many employees in Culver City, people who um, bus tables or are in service jobs. Their employers do not uh, subsidize Offer free parking. parking. No, they do not. Okay. And um, mm. what, what happened was those folks, I live in downtown Culver City, so those folks were increasingly parking on the residential streets mm -hmm. because they couldn't, they didn't have the funds to pay for parking in the structures downtown. So the neighbors got upset and said, we want, we want uh, permitted parking. We don't want those people parking for free on our streets, mm -hmm. which I opposed. I felt that's not right. They're making minimum wage and, and wow. they've, you know, scra scraped up enough to drive, uh, buy a car and drive, you know, f because taking the bus will take them hours because they'll have to transfer so many times. So, but I'm not interested in just limiting this to um, employees, but just people with fewer financial resources. It seems like they're the only ones who are really disadvantaged by this system. People who are more affluent can have the luxury of saying, oh, well, I don't care if it costs 10 bucks or 20 bucks to park and mm -hmm. I will do that. But those who don't have the funds um, and maybe need to visit a certain establishment, uh, they will be in a t tough situation. They have several small children, and then they have to park far, far away, or take their kids on the bus, you know, three buses, and they are working already mm -hmm. in a job. So if you could say something about the... I think that's yeah. a very important question, and I have an answer. You know, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, I guess I should stay then. I was what? trying, I didn't want to... Block the view, but oh, well, no, this I do is fine. Yes. Um, well, that uh, one of the arguments against um, charging for curb parking as long as necessary is uh, that the waiters and the, uh, the night workers at restaurants and like uh, that, that, that they can't afford to pay at the meter and they can't afford to pay um, at. Um, 
for, for parking at, at night especially, because the, the low paid workers often are, work at night. And so you, if you ran the meters into the evening, when the waiters tend to park at the curb, uh, that you cause a hardship to them. And I, uh, I always, whenever I go to a restaurant, I always ask the waiter, where did you park? Um, and if the meters uh, stop operating at 6 o'clock, they usually say, well, I try to get here around 5.30 so I can find a meter, and then I could park for you all evening. So if you took that away and started charging during the evening, that would be a, a problem. So what some cities do is that they uh, provide social justice parking. Is that, oh. that for in Because the, there's a lot of empty spaces in parking garages at night, and banks and office buildings and things like that that they provide free or very cheap parking to all low-income employees in the evening so that, the, uh, the, so that they will be held harmless. And once I was uh, the, the speaking in Santa Rosa, I'd never been there. It was a wonderful little town. And I gave a talk rather like this one. It was a much bigger audience and a huge auditorium that was in, in stadium seating. And I thought I had made a convincing argument. But the, um, as soon as the first question was from a guy at the top on the left, and he jumped out of his seat so hard, and he wasn't foaming at the mouth, but he must have been spitting because people were recoiling. And he said that if this city begins charging for parking after 6 p.m., I will never come downtown to a restaurant again. And so that answered, you know, that, that settles the question. Uh, and it, you know, a mayor couldn't get into an argument with them you know, because it may be the tip of an iceberg. So I said, well, if you don't come downtown uh, to a restaurant, uh, somebody will be able to take the space that you would have occupied. And who do you think will leave a bigger tip in a restaurant? Somebody will come downtown only if they can park free after driving around for 20 minutes? Or somebody who's willing to pay for parking? Uh, if they can find a space. And maybe you'll be better off in the food court of a suburban mall with ample free parking. And the whole audience being laughing and shouting. So th this was a minority interest. But anyway, the issue came up about what about waiters who would have to pay uh, for, for parking in, in the evening. And I think the way to do it is not to leave all the parking free and creating terrible problems for, for businesses. And the restaurants, they would have fewer customers and they couldn't hire as many waiters and they wouldn't get as many tips. It would be better to, to use some of the city's uh, uh, public structures to say, well, we will give you a, a free or, or, or very cheap parking uh, in the evening. Okay, well, I think that's, uh, I've said everything I know. <laughs> Thank you.